we simply cannot allow people to pour into the United States undetected, undocumented, unchecked. And complete the dang fence. This bill that we will sign today is not a revolutionary bill. Cast down your bucket where you are. We come from France. And I am, you know, adamantly against illegal immigrants. They're coming in by the thousands, just unbelievable. A wall is an immorality. Who are you rooting for? Those masters of the universe are at it again. You maniac! You blew it up! This is Todd Bensman standing in this week for Executive Director Mark Krikorian on our weekly podcast, Parsing Immigration Policy. We're going to interview Sheriff Greg Capers of San Jacinto County, Texas. Usually, sheriffs of border counties are interviewed on TV and podcasts because they're on the front line of the border crisis. But San Jacinto County, Texas, and its county seat of Cold Spring are situated more than 300 miles from the Texas-Mexico border, about 50 miles northeast of Houston. It's an interior county by definition. Yet, this county entered national consciousness in May 2023 when a multiply deported Mexican national who owns a home there murdered five Hondurans next door and then went on the run for four days before 250 officers in a wide-scale manhunt finally caught him. This attracted heavy international media coverage. And then in June, San Jacinto County commissioners approved a declaration of disaster based on the border crisis. So I thought it would be a good thing to have Sheriff Capers come in and talk about what it's like in his county so far from the border. Sheriff, before we get into all this, tell us a little bit about you, your history, and your county. Well, as an 18-year-old boy, I started my career at Texas Department of Corrections, where I worked the Ellis Unit, where back then they housed death row. A year and a half later, two years, I, I quit and I went to the Harris County Sheriff's Office, where I become a deputy sheriff. Now, since then, I've done 30 years with Harris County, and I quit and ran for sheriff here within San Jacinto County, and I have now been the sheriff for nine years. Great. Right next door is Liberty County, which has been gaining a lot of renown lately as a location of maybe the largest community of illegal immigrants in the United States. 75,000, they say, in a community called Colony Ridge right next door there but also expanding fast in an unprecedented kind of boom. So in terms of crime and law enforcement, how in your mind has that population explosion impacted on the broader region, including in your own county there in San Jacinto? Well, I don't want to say anything about Liberty County because I don't work over there. I control San Jacinto County and the law enforcement that's done here sure. with my guys. But yeah, there are a vast number of illegal immigrants living within five miles of my jurisdiction. We also have an influence of four cartels in my county. They live in four different areas, and we have had nine murders this year alone. Would that include those nine murders include the five Hondurans, or is that nine other murders? No, so that does include the the five from uh, the Trails Inn subdivision, which is located within my jurisdiction. So there have been another four murders in just just a couple of months since then. Let me ask you this, just for a little bit of background, would you say that it's true what people like me and, and some others say about that area, which is that it's something like a law enforcement no-go zone, or like a sanctuary from federal law enforcement for sure, but even state law enforcement in terms of policing such large numbers of illegal immigrants in that area. Is it? You're talking about the colonies? The colonies and the whole area around there. We patrol our area, and I applaud anybody that has a badge and a gun if they want to come into my area. I mean, and if it's the feds, if it's the state, if it's the local policeman, if it's the school district policeman. I've been brought up that way that we we are a brotherhood, and I will allow whoever to come into my county to uh, work whatever kind of legal investigation they have to work. I know we have called ICE several times for crimes that were federal crimes that that we had no state to put on a person, and we got no help from the ICE office. 
do they just not answer the calls or or do you get an a, some kind of an explanation well here's normally what happens we'll call we'll get a hold of someone and then they say if it runs through their computer system or whatever they will call us right back and they will get to us but if we don't hear from them within x number of minutes then there's nothing that they can do for us got it so i mean i guess after some time you kind of stop calling no sir we we call every time every time we have a, a an incident that, that requires federal help we call we just don't get a lot of response from the federal government well let's move on to the mass murder out there francisco oropesa so he's this kentucky deported mexican who's now charged with the killings of his honduran neighbors i've been out to his house and their house since then your deputies and federal law enforcement tracked him down after about four days and i guess they found him in a pile of laundry in conroe about 20 miles from there i know he's going to stand trial and the case is ongoing but how could a guy with this kind of criminal history feel so safe enough in san jacinto county to have bought a home there and they got married and was raising children and had horses and and all that how did that happen we didn't even know that he existed, to my knowledge, until June the 14th of 2022, when he had evidently he had assaulted his wife, domestic partner, whatever term that they want to use. That's how we first found out about him. And then we filed charges on him. When we filed charges on him on June the 28th of the same year, 14 days later, she comes to the district attorney's office files a non-prosecution statement saying that he did not do it, that he didn't hurt her, or whatever story she came up with. And so the district attorney at that time, I believe, dropped charges on him because no complaining witness. The guy had been deported, I think, four or five times. It's been reported in the media. But, but I guess if you couldn't get ICE out there for um, any other reason, that you probably wouldn't have been able to get them out there for him back in 2022. Is that about right? Well, yes, sir. That's all conjecture, but I, I would not disagree with that statement, no. Do we have any information at all that can be disclosed about his involvement in the criminal underworld there, if any? No, sir. Not, not at this time, because it is an ongoing active case, and he has been charged with capital murder. Yeah, I, I kind of figured I'd get an answer like that, but you, you never can tell. What can you tell us about the victims? I mean, how long have they been in the country? I guess initially it was incorrectly reported that they were all in the country illegally, but it turns out that that might not have been the case. I mean, what do we know about their immigration status, if you can talk about that? I personally cannot, and, and I don't believe any of my detectives could, because when the shooting went down, we went to the house, we surrounded the house, we went in, we cleared it. And then we immediately started looking for the shooter, the five Hondurans. We were putting those in cars and getting those out to another location. Since then, I have not seen them but one time, and that was here about two weeks ago, maybe a week and a half ago in the courtroom at one of his uh, hearings. Can you describe that a little bit? I mean, what were they, what was their demeanor? What was, did they testify about anything or were they just sort of there? Well, I know they were just there just to be there to watch the proceedings. Got it. Are they sort of typical of the immigrant population that's moved into uh, your county? I mean, who's living in San Jacinto from out of the country? Hondurans, Mexican nationals. We had Chinese, Vietnamese, Cubans. Got it. And would you say that the trajectory of their population is sort of going up lately or kind of status quo? Or Yes, sir. It is growing. I believe I pulled some statistics a couple of weeks ago, and the demographics of San Jacinto County were 66% white, 163 or 6% Hispanic, and 9 point something black, and then rest of the makeup is others. Got it. So the next month after the tragedy in June, San Jacinto County Commissioner's Court approved a declaration of local disaster. Yes, sir. You were 
a prime proponent of this. You cited increased drug smuggling and some other things. Can you provide more detail and context about why you pursued this declaration of local disaster so far from the border? Well, you know, I, I did all of this based off of our governor's plea to the state of Texas and the rest of the world that every county is now a border county. And when he did that, I, with my county and my crime rate, which has spiked this year, fell off, you know, it was a little bit lower last year. A couple of years ago, it spiked once more. But I've had five people shot. I've had one murder by a Mexican national, had a meth lab and a grow houses. We've had a Pakistani Air Force officer murder one person and triple a woman inside of my county. He about beat her to death with a baseball bat. And then I've had a cockfighting ring in my county that was all done by Vietnamese nationals. And then the cartel has provided security for that cockfighting ring. Well, you did mention earlier that cartels were active there. How do you really know and you know which cartels would you say they are? Because this, they, they actually had signs going into their areas. The cartels are the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, the Gulf Cartel, the Los Zetas, and the Sinaloa Cartel. What are they involved in? They do cockfighting. They do dogfighting. They do grow houses, meth labs, so on and so forth. Prostitution. By prostitution, do you mean... Anything that has to do that could be called sex trafficking or? There is probably sex trafficking going on in my county. There is gambling going on in my county. There are safe houses that I know of in our county. We're currently working online cases of sex trafficking with these cartels. Oh, you know, where the activity is actually in your county? Yes, sir. They're ongoing cases, but they meet each other on the internet, they pay online. To meet for sex, sex acts, things along that, that is how they're sex trafficking. You also mentioned a grow house or a grow operation that you broke up recently. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it was run by Cuban nationals. They had probably two or three, four acres, and they had two houses sitting on it. They were stealing electricity and had it plugged into the main house, three different areas, because when we actually went in, took the people into custody, got them secured in a patrol vehicle and took them to jail. We started trying to cut the power off and we could not do that. So we then called the electrical company. The electrical company came out, cut it off, and it was still running. They went to the house, cut it off where they thought it was feeding into, and it was still running. They did it this three times, I believe. And the third time they was finally able to cut all the power to the house. But at that particular raid, we seized over 400 pounds and I believe 180, 89, 59, 89 trees that ranged anywhere from three and a half to four foot all the way up to almost nine foot tall. What would you say the value was of all that dope? Probably over $700,000 easy. It was premium pot. It had been going on for at least a, a couple of years that I would feel safe sitting here and, and talking to you about. When they first started this thing off, they started small because they were perfecting their game, and then they just bought more lights, more fertilizer, more, and they perfected it. And it this took a couple of years for them to perfect, and then they started adding on other structures to put these marijuana plants in to make their uh, grow flourish. What does a disaster declaration mean, like materially, for San Jacinto County? I mean, what do you get from from a disaster declaration? Well, that's one of the caveats to being able to put in for Operation Lone Star. It is all off of a grant. It's a call, what the state of Texas calls an EAT grant, and they have certain parameters. And that is one of the, the parameters is that the, the county court, the county commissioners have to sit down and declare a declaration of disaster for any monies to come from the state of Texas. In other words, you have to through certain steps to be able to put in for money from the state of Texas. Operation Lone Star, of course, being the state of Texas's surge operations of state troopers and National Guard all along the Texas-Mexico border. But you're so far from the border, 
Where are you on trying to get some grant money on that? And what are your plans if you were to get that grant? Well, I, I am uh, I'm a guy that doesn't give up and I will fight to the bitter end until I hopefully make it before the governor of the state of Texas and get to tell him because I know him. He knows me. He called me twice during the Orpesa manhunt. And he said anything that we needed, the state was there to help us. And they did. They sent their criminal intelligence division, probably maybe 30 or 50 officers. And I put together the 250 man manhunt team. And we worked that in conjunction with the FBI and the feds in the state of Texas. And the, the governor himself called me and said anything that I need. After that, you know, I put on the uh, a town hall so that I could bring information to the citizens here within my county from the border experts, which would be three sheriffs from down there and a county judge from down there. I had Bob Bryce with Breitbart. He spends a lot of time on the border. And I just wanted them to be able to talk about the, the problems that South Texas has gone through. And that way we could somehow prepare our citizens up here as to what might be coming this year, next year, or the year after, because South Texas has been living this since, what, 2009 or, or maybe even before. But it's been 10 or 11 years ago, I, I feel comfortable to say, because I go to the border. I go to the border probably three, four, six times a year and meet with these sheriffs and see what I can do as far as working out you know, what, what they need, what, what they can help me with. And I have learned a whole lot from going down there and watching these guys and, and getting the upfront and personal view. What would you be able to do with Operation Lone Star grant money so far from the border? Like, how, how do you envision using that? Yeah, I, I can tell you that, that we put in for like a license plate reader for our county. We would have bought 10 vehicles, six patrol cars, four undercover vehicles. We would have put six men on the street, and we, I mean, I, I say would have. If this goes through, this is what we will do with it. And they would have a dedicated job. We would have an analyst to sit there and analyze our computers, other counties' computers, and try to come up with a best-known time, date, location, and then we could set this TAC team, this border security team, on different locations here within our own county but we would also be open to signing memorandums of understanding, better known as a MOU, with other counties, other, other constables, other police departments, other agencies, and then they could come on as a uh, task force officer, which is known as a TFO, and then they would work in these cars. They would work with us, and collectively, we would then be able to divert a lot of this traffic coming in and out of our area to include whatever county signed on to an MOU with me. And because it's Operation Lone Star budget grant money, then it would be, you know, crimes associated with the border 300 miles away? Yes. If they are drug cartel, because the four that are in our county, they didn't start in America. They started in Mexico. One thing I noticed in local media accounts when you declared this disaster is that you had hundreds of local citizens turn out in support of it. What does that tell you that so many people in your county showed up in favor of this thing? Well, we're tired of it. Three months ago, I was in El Paso, and I heard from a very high-ranking U.S. Customs border official in front of everybody else that was at this expo, probably three, four, six hundred people. And he so stated that unless we do something right now, by this time next year, there will be 4.8 million new residents here within America. And my county, we're tired of it. But on the other hand, I am 100% for legal immigration. It's just illegal that I have a problem with the masses that are coming across the southern border. In my opinion, the federal government is doing nothing other than bumping their gums, talking a bunch of trash, and doing nothing to stop the illegal flow of immigrants coming across the southern border. The call load in our area has picked up to help deal with this problem, and I still today have the same number of patrolmen 
that I had nine years ago working the streets on a daily basis. Our county is 66% national forest, of which we don't get a red penny for running up and down a forest service road. I don't care if we're cutting from point A to point B to get there quicker, or if we're actually in the forest looking for a vehicle. The government used to pay. We just filled out a form, turned it into the government, and they would send us monies back for patrolling their national forest. But they have two people, maybe a third now, that patrol all of southeast Texas and half of Louisiana. Three people. Other than that, they're hoping and praying, I guess, that we, the local sheriffs, we, local law enforcement, pick up their slack and find the stolen vehicles. We rolled up on one one time. A man was riding a horse in the woods, came upon 30 vehicles parked out in the National Forest. How much federal government help do you think we got by working that entire case and finding the owners and everything that comes along with that one investigation? Done. And those were stolen vehicles or what was it? Yes, sir. They were stolen vehicles. And they were parked within a half a mile of one of those four cartels that I had told y'all about earlier. So just to kind of wrap things up here, because I think we're getting close to time. I'm sure you get asked about this a lot. I do too. But, you know, what do you think might be the silver bullet to slow or impede the fast growth of illegal aliens in interior counties like Liberty and San Jacinto? What's the silver bullet if, if there is one? More manpower. We need more policemen. We need more deputy sheriff. We need help from the federal government, from the state of Texas, because that is why the cartels, in my opinion, that is why the illegal immigration is moving from the southern border. They move up to an area like what is in my county, like what is in other counties, is simply because when they get there, when they're asked, they so state that. Once they get here, they don't have to worry about law enforcement because they've moved out into the rural where we're not 4,000 deputies strong. We're not 6,000 policemen strong. My county, we have three policemen working at any time during a 24-hour period. And we have a hard time getting people to stay here because it's not attractive to come to work for us because of the pay. We can't pay like a bigger city that has a bustling tax base. We need money to be able to hire people in today's law enforcement world. There's only two ways to patrol. You either reactive patrol or you proactive patrol. We are so short, we just have reactive. We just don't have that luxury because of our funding here within our county. Got it. All right, Sheriff, I think that probably ought to wrap it up for this one, and I appreciate all that you do. Yes, sir. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thanks, Todd. This is Todd Bensman, again, filling in for Executive Director Mark Corian this week. He'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, signing off.